Hi, I'm Wayne and this is Bass Door Woodworking. This video is the first in what I hope will become a recurring series on this channel where I do a deep dive into the history of a tool, starting with this one, the radial arm saw. This is a radial arm saw. Simply put, it's a circular saw held in a yoke that moves along this top rail to cut stock that's placed on the table. In the case of ripping, the yoke is locked into place and the stock is moved along the table, much like an upside down table saw. Nowadays, the radial arm saw has pretty much completely fallen out of favor with your typical woodworker. This is due to a couple of factors that we'll touch on later on. But there was a time not too long ago when the radial arm saw was widely considered the indispensable tool in woodworking shops. So let's start with the why. Why does this tool exist? Well, to get into some absolute woodworking basics, there are two main types of cuts in woodworking, rip cuts and cross cuts. Rip cuts are cuts along the grain, splitting the fibers the long way. And cross cuts are cuts across the grain just severing the fibers. But even more simply, you can cut things long ways or short ways. Cutting things long ways had very successfully been solved by the table saw. It's a fast, accurate, repeatable, and mostly safe way to cut a board the long way. You set the fence and go. It does not require a skilled worker to do it, and you can mass produce pieces very quickly this way. But cross cuts or cutting the short way is a different story. Before the radial arm saw, cross cuts and mitered cuts, or cuts at an angle, um, were done a few different ways. Using a handsaw, either loose or in a miter box. They also had a thing called a standard miter box, which um, I'll put a picture up on the screen now. I don't own one, so I can't you know, demonstrate it. But it was essentially a miter box that never came apart. Using a table saw, hopefully using a miter gauge or a cross cut sled. Or using a circular saw. Handheld circular saws came about around the same time as the radial arm saw, but sawmills were using a mounted variations of what you would recognize as a circular saw well before then, such as the Swain or Pendulum saw. I don't own one, I'll put a picture. Now it's not hard to identify the drawbacks of each of those. The handsaw is labor intensive and requires us, the craftsperson to have a certain level of skill for precision miters even when using a static or adjustable miter box. The table saw gives you precision and removes some of the labor, but it adds a level of difficulty and just plain awkwardness when dealing with larger stock. Moving large pieces of lumber over the stationary blade was not only tiring but oftentimes dangerous. A circular saw takes away the awkwardness of dealing with large stock, but the versatility and portability of the circular saw lowers its precision, and they were not all that common before the radial arm saw was created. The Swain or Pendulum saw can overcome the loss of precision with a good setup you can make very repeatable and precise cuts, but a Swain saw is not portable and could not easily be transported to a work site. A Swain saw would be installed in a mill or a workshop and become a fixture of that space. All of these drawbacks don't even really bring into question the safety of performing any of these functions. The radial arm saw was invented by Raymond DeWalt in 1922. He went on to form the DeWalt Products Company in 1924. Yep, that DeWalt. To produce and sell his newly patented tool, originally marketed as the DeWalt Wonder Worker. So DeWalt comes along with the radial arm saw, which addresses every one of the shortcomings I listed previously. The radial arm saw is not labor intensive. It does not require a skilled craftsperson to operate it. I'm proof of that. Someone can set it up and station a worker at it all day and have them batch out parts without even necessarily knowing what part they're cutting. It's precise and can make repeatable miters. And they were comparatively safe, especially when doing with larger stock. Lumber would be stationary on the table while the blade was moved through the stock using the carriage. They were instantly successful, and when installed in a shop or set up on a worksite, they enabled craftsmen to produce repeatedly precise cuts more quickly and efficiently. Carpenters would build different fixtures and jigs for the radial arm saw to increase its already impressive versatility. The saws continued to grow in popularity through the 1930s, with other companies starting to release their variations on DeWalt's design intended to increase both the utility and performance of the machine. 
In the post-World War II 40s, the saws really saw a growth in their adoption, with the radial arm saw becoming a staple of both professional and amateur shops. This is also where you see an explosion of different attachments and accessories offered for these saws. You would see molding heads, joint or planer heads, sanding drums, saber saws, drill chucks, lathes, and the list goes on and on and on. The radial arm saw went from being the indispensable tool of the trades to being marketed to homeowners and enthusiasts as the only tool you need. For home woodworkers with very limited space, these radial arm saws were a wonderful invention. They were essentially marketed as, you bring this tool to a lot and this tool will literally build a home around it. And this is where I think a lot of the criticism within the woodworking community of radial arm saws originates. No history of the radial arm saw is complete without a robust discussion asking the question, are radial arm saws safe to use? You see this question posted everywhere online and without fail there will be multiple people who make the same, not if you want to keep all your fingers comment. So let's dig into that question a little bit more by reframing it. Why are radial arm saws thought to be dangerous? Through the 50s, 60s, and 70s, the radial arm saw was marketed as these do-all machines. This particular saw is from the early 1950s. This was actually a great sales position for a company to take with a radial arm saw because in truth, you can do a hell of a lot with these saws. The question really is, should you? And the answer to that question also changes with time. It's very easy to say now that absolutely you shouldn't do those things because they're dangerous. But, the tools available to people at the time was very different than now. When these saws were being sold new in the 40s through the 70s, they were inarguably more affordable than a lot of the other options available to the home woodworker, especially those with limited space. The one tool to rule them all mentality of the marketing has though led to some valid criticisms of the radial arm saw today. This is a topic that has been covered at length by much larger channels than mine, and I'll link a couple of videos in the description. But briefly, manufacturers across the board start promoting some pretty sketchy practices using their saws that absolutely would not fly today. Um, Stumpy Nubs did an excellent overview of these, so I won't go too in depth about them here, and will instead encourage you to check out his video on it. It'll be linked below. But here's some of my favorites. Um, using the radial arm saw as a shaper, um, this method of rabbiting using a radial arm saw, jointing with the radial arm saw, cutting panels in this manner, and also cutting rafter notches with this gigantic piece of metal attached to your radial arm saw. I definitely would not recommend using a radial arm saw for any of those purposes in the way outlined in the manuals they were sending with these saws. Some of the processes can be done differently using a radial arm saw, more on that later. And I would argue that the unsafe reputation of the radial arm saw stems more from the craftsman's safety recall than anything else. You see, in 1999, the Consumer Product Safety Commission began an investigation into what they saw as a pattern of injuries caused by the incomplete nature of the blade guard on craftsman radial arm saws. To dig into this deeper, let's go over to a craftsman radial arm saw. You see, the blade guard on traditional radial arm saws only covers the top half of the blade unlike the guards you'd see on a miter saw or a table saw that completely covered the blade. The commission cited injuries caused by contact with the blade or by wood being kicked back by the saw, including hand and finger amputations, cut and broken hands and fingers, and facial injuries as being directly caused by the nature of the saw's blade guard. And in November of 2000, Emerson, who manufactured these saws for Sears, issued a safety recall on 3.7 million Craftsman radial arm saw sold between the years of 1958 and 1995, making this saw absolutely within that um, time frame, and my other Craftsman radial arm saw is also within that time frame. To those yelling at their screens, but statistically it's not really that big of a deal. The commission's report was based on 300 instances of serious injuries spanning 40 years. That's not a lot. 300 injuries against an estimated 3.7 million saws is 0.008%. This is a video, not a conversation. I can't hear you. Um, and more accurately, that is not how statistics are calculated, and that's not the methodology used for, to determine the recall. The commission investigated 300 injuries and found what they believe to be the design flaw that caused those injuries. 
and they applied the recall retroactively to all saws that had this same design. I think it's also important to mention that this was a very real safety concern and it's excellent that Emerson acted quickly in response to the commission's report and immediately started offering retrofit blade kits to all compatible saws for years. As late as 2009, you could still send for a retrofit kit. It would be very easy to just be very jaded and say, well, they didn't want to be sued. And no one wants to be sued but they could have just done what they ended up doing later in the recall, and they started paying owners to disassemble the carriage of their saw and send it back to Emerson to be destroyed. Was that necessary? I'm not sure. I mean, I can see both sides of it. Certain saws could not be economically retrofitted to um, have updated blade guards, but I also agree with the mostly agree with the camp that says that these saws weren't the public safety hazard they were made out to be and that destroying the saw entirely is an overreaction. This recall was massive and the unprecedented 40 year time span of the recall created a perception among the general public that these saws sitting in every garage workshop were a clear and present danger. Articles in newspapers and the already declining popularity of the tool due to the adoption of miter saws, sliding miter saws, um, etc. More on that later. Made it easy for the tool to be tagged as just generally unsafe and it hastened its fall into obscurity. But to circle back, were these things actually that dangerous? Were a disproportionate number of people actually getting injured using these things? It's hard to say and there's a lot of factors to take into account. How many injuries were attributed to the operation of this saw? How many of the saws were out there? Radio arm saws were already falling in popularity and were not as common in the shop as they once were, unlike table saws, for example. When researching statistics for this video, I kept coming across this figure. 350 injuries per year are attributed to the operation of radial arm saws. I saw it being referenced in forums, websites, blogs, social media, and other articles, but I could not find the root source of this number. The nearest I can tell, the number starts popping up around the time of the recall. So, I mean, it could be something as simple as people taking the 300 or so injuries that were the basis of the Product Safety Commission's investigation and not understanding and then tra not tracing it all the way back to get the, the actual data. Finding hard data for injury statistics for radial arm saws is non-trivial. A lot of annual reports will lump radial arm saws in with band saws and others due to the small number of the saws out there, or they will use estimates based on sampling instead of hard data. The radial arm saw is not prevalent anymore, and it's hard to get a large enough sample size to accurately predict what percentage of operators of these saws will be injured by them. And they are all very forthright about this in their reports, most even pointing out that their figures should be used with caution because of the very small sample size, some as few as like 27. <laughs> Other reports take the total number of injuries by saws in a year, and then they break them down by the type of saw that caused it. These are helpful, but they often lump saws together into categories such as bench top and stationary, instead of table saw, miter saw, radial arm saw, band saw. If we take the data that the commission's report was based on as true and that these things were causing a disproportionate number of injuries due to their design flaws, um, in order to get a real idea of how many people are actually getting injured by using these things now, I went over to the Consumer Product Safety Commission's website and utilized their National Electronic Injury Surveillance System, which we'll just refer to as NEISS from now on, um, and pulled the last 10 available years of injuries attributed to radio arm sauce from 2012 to 2022. And anyone can do this. It's all publicly available data. It's a very easy to use interface. I would, if you're ever looking into this kind of stuff, I highly recommend it. So here's the data. You can pause if you'd like to dig into it, but I'll be going over most of it. It's important to note that this is about 10 years worth of data. Most of this data is what you'd expect, finger lacerations, average age of 63, um, predominantly male. Um, nothing really stands out except... How did you cut your thigh using a radial arm saw? You gotta unplug it before you give it smooches. Protect your thigh. But seriously, one thing that may stand out to you is just how few injuries there are, 45 over 10 years. 
Now, it's important to note that these are only reported injuries. Surely there are injuries that go unreported or misreported or even reported in a way that does not explicitly name the tool that caused the injury. It's also important to remember how uncommon radio arm saws now are in the typical woodworking shop. I mean, look at the ages of these people injured by them. These are likely people who bought these tools new when they were popular and being marketed in the shady ways covered earlier. But I still think that these numbers are illuminating. I mean, there's an easy argument to be made that the reduced numbers of injuries are proof that the recalls on these saws did increase safety and reduce injuries. This video is supposed to be focused more on an overview and history of the radio arm saw and not an indictment of or a defense of the safety of the tool. But it's also no secret that I have a certain affinity for these tools, so I think we have time for a short diversion. Not to get too in the weeds on this, but there are normal processes that have been argued as being unsafe that I personally believe the radial arm saw excels at, and there are no more dangerous than other widely accepted safe methods. In my opinion, the radial arm saw to this day is the unmatched cane of cross-cutting. Once you install a fence and get the machine dialed in, no tool matches the precision, capacity, and quality of cut that the radial arm saw provides. Some will argue that the radial arm saw is inherently dangerous as you need to pull the saw towards you through whatever stock you're cutting, which can lead to the blade climbing and lurching towards you. Um, this can lead to a level of maiming many feel is distasteful for a hobby woodworking machine. While I agree that there are inherent dangers to using the saw, I don't think that this is a unique danger of the radial arm saw. Furthermore, the danger is easily remediated by following basic safety procedures, such as using the correct negative hook blade and correct body placement, making sure your hands are never in front of anything that you're cutting. Same way you would on a table saw or anything with a spinning blade. You don't get yourself in front of it. While responding to the argument that I just made essentially of a climbing saw should not be dangerous because your body should not be in the path of the blade, um, James Hamilton from Stumpy Nubs says in his video, that is correct. In a perfect world, but I live in reality, and the reality of it is an unexpected climb with a radio arm saw is very startling. Um, he goes on to say that involuntary muscle movement can lead to you putting your hands in harm's way and causing injury. I would have to argue respectfully because he is a obviously very skilled woodworker with years more experience than I have and has for years proven himself to take safety very seriously and has repeatedly stated in other videos that he does not think that the radio arm saw is any more dangerous than any other power tool, just that the marketing of radio arm saws promoted some sketchy stuff. But I would still argue that the climbing blade being startling is simply beside the point. When you are using any power tool, it is your responsibility to account for and protect against the unexpected. Startling things can happen using any tool. Your router bit can come loose and shoot out of its collet, a bandsaw blade can break. Those are both incredibly startling, but we plan against them by positioning ourselves safely and checking setups. Vigilance should be the name of the game when using anything with a motor or with an edge. I think those that disavow the radial arm saw entirely as being unsafe are, in my opinion, misguided. But back from that tangent, I certainly don't think that cross-cutting on the radial arm saw is more dangerous than other processes that are virtually universally accepted. For example, the circular saw, especially using the often cited speed square hack. For those that don't know the speed square hack is you take the speed square, you butt it up against your piece of wood so that the ledge is holding. You take your circular saw, mine doesn't have a battery because this is demonstration, and you ride your, the fence of your circular saw against your speed square and you will get a square cut. You'll see dozens if not hundreds of DIY YouTube channels promoting this hack to get square cuts with a circular saw and there's simply no way that this is safer than using a stationary radial arm saw. Do I think that people should not do this trick? No, but I do think that it should not be promoted as a hack to beginner woodworkers because it ignores a lot of important safety practices. One being not getting your hand closer to a blade than it needs to be. Now to the screams of sliding miter saw and cross cut table saw sled. Sliding miter saws are very similar to a radial arm saw insofar as they are essentially a circular saw on a carriage that allows you to cross cut wide stock. 
Sliding miter saw is also eliminate pulling the blade towards yourself to make the cut. You're probably saying to the screen, again, I cannot hear you, you really aren't getting this medium. But yes, that is true. Those sliding miter saws have their own dangers that need to be considered. And the main difference is that all the problems with sliding miter saws do not label them as hazards because of them. Table saw crosscut sleds are a fantastic alternative for smaller pieces, but you end up right back to what necessitated the invention of the radial arm saw when you start having to cut larger and longer stock. Not to mention that most crosscut sleds require you to remove the blade guard of your saw for it to function. So again, for my money, no tool matches the precision, capacity, and quality of cut of the radial arm saw. I've only used my radial arm saws for ripping on a few occasions, and it was mostly just to test um, and to see for myself with all the horror stories um, I've heard about ripping on a radial arm saw held any weight. And for the life of me, I can't understand why this is such a hated feature of this saw. Just like a table saw or a track saw, 90% of the safety of the cut is achieved with a proper setup. While it's true that you have to take into account different concerns when ripping on a table saw versus a radial arm saw, for example, you don't have to worry about blade height when using a radial arm saw, you do need to be worried about the feed direction. And you need to be concerned with being square to the blade and the fence the same way on both. You need to follow the same procedures for applying pressure towards the tabletop and towards the fence for both. I love cutting dados on the regular arm saw. Being able to line up um, and see my dado as I'm cutting it is fantastic. I feel like I'm in more control when using the regular arm saw versus using a router to plow dados. Not to mention the few occasions I've had to hack out some rabbits with a router. Um, to be completely honest though, the tool that I still consider myself afraid of is the router. I think that they are among the most dangerous tools in any shop. And I think a lot of beginner word workers become complacent around them because they get used to doing roundovers and assume that the tool is always that cooperative. Don't get me wrong, I still respect all of my tools and am fully aware of the damage they can cause. And that's just the key to safety. My dad has always told me, you do not need to fear any tool, but you do need to show them respect because they sure as hell will not show you any. A dado stack installed in a radial arm saw can be a wonderful thing. There are a couple of processes that I highlighted as being sketchy earlier that I would not be nearly as nervous about using a dado stack in place of a molder or a planer head, such as notching posts or um, sawing panels even. But back to history. In 1964, the compound miter saw was invented and released by Rockwell. It quickly grew in popularity, even with the width limitations posed by the 8, 10, and 12 inch blades. Those dimensions were more than adequate for most professional and hobby woodworkers, especially framers and finished carpenters that were mostly dealing with dimensional lumber and molding. Radial arm saws still had their place though and stayed relatively popular through the 70s and 80s. You could still easily buy them new and they were still mostly considered a staple of established shops, but it was undoubtedly true that they were steadily losing out to the compound miter saw. And around this time, more portable variations of the radial arm saw were being produced and sold by manufacturers like Ryobi, hoping to create a larger capacity competitor for the miter saw. It was really the invention of the sliding compound miter saw in the 80s, either 1982 or 1988, that truly relegated the radial arm saw to the history books. They were lighter and easily transported to and from job sites, they could um, cross-cut stock comparable to a radial arm saw, and they took up less space. Their smaller footprint meant that they could be stored away more easily when not in use, and most importantly, they could be produced and sold cheaply. Soon companies that had been manufacturing radial arm saws for over 50 years started removing the saws from their product line. DeWalt stopped producing radial arm saws in the USA in 1985 and completely stopped selling them in 1988. While Sears held on a bit longer and were still manufacturing and selling radial arm saws as recently as 1997. Today there are only a couple of routes you can go to purchase a new radial arm saw if you live in the United States in 2024. You can order them through suppliers like Granger, and they'll come from Taiwan and other countries that still use a radial arm saw pretty frequently. Um, and there's also a, a company in the US called the Original Saw Company that still manufactures and sells radial arm saws. Globally, they're still pretty available as well, um, but I'm unsure of how all that import stuff works. OK, 
Okay, so to kind of just wrap things up, the radio arm saw was a perfectly timed invention and it had, it had a massive impact. Putting aside the changes it brought to the worksite in terms of productivity, precision, and repeatability, it can be argued that the radial arm saw made the hobby of woodworking accessible. This tool made it possible for people who were limited in space and budget to have a wood shop, and I think that's a really cool legacy for this tool to have. They're still incredibly useful machines, and I'll continue to scoop them up as often as my wife forgets how many I have. But that about does it for this little history of the radial arm saw. Thank you for watching, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe to keep up to date with new projects as they are released, and until next time, thank you.